Okay, so um, I think we'll make uh, a beginning. So welcome everyone to the 11th seminar of the Contemporary Women's Writing and the Medical Humanities online seminar series. Organized with the support of the Center for Contemporary Women's Writing and the Institute of Modern Languages Research, London. This online seminar series for postgraduates and early career researchers seeks to explore how contemporary women's writing in particular, be this fiction, poetry, autobiographical or philosophical writing, is currently engaging with issues such as illness, disease, healthcare, medical practice and clinical institutions. We have so far covered a wide range of themes from hospital architecture to end of life care to pregnancy and childbirth and sexual health, pain and pleasure. We started in September 2020 and we are continuing until March 2021 with fortnightly seminars always on Tuesday evenings at 5.30 UK time until 7pm. Uh, you can register for the seminars via the IMLR uh, website and we'll put the, the link in the chat for the, the seminars after this and you can always look on the website for upcoming seminars. Uh, we also have our summer conference that's coming up soon in July. And so thanks very much to everyone that sent in abstracts for that conference. Um, yeah, we're very grateful for that. And uh, we'll be getting back to you all uh, shortly. Uh, just for a few Zoom house rules before we begin. So this session is being recorded so that it can be uploaded to the IMLR website. So please feel free to turn your cameras off or on, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, we'll be having the, uh, the three 15 minute papers first and then a Q&A session. So if you could all remain on mute uh, until the Q&A session, that would be very much appreciated. During the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to use the raise hand option on Zoom and then we'll ask you to unmute. The raise hand icon is found through clicking participants and then your own name and then there's an option to raise hand in the options. You may also want to type the word question into the chat box uh, and then we can come to you next. If you're not comfortable with voicing your own question, uh, you can write them in the chat box function at the bottom of the Zoom bar and then we can, either me or Becky can um, pose your questions to the speakers. So uh, please feel free to add your questions to the chat as we're listening to these papers or at any time during the session. Um, so we'll now be doing audio description for the seminars. Uh, so we would kindly ask all speakers to auto describe themselves and any visuals in their presentations as much as possible. Uh, for the captioning, there is a button at the bottom of the screen labeled CC, um, live transcript, which you can use to add auto captions to this seminar. So I'll just quickly auto describe myself. So uh, my name's Benjamin Dalton and I'm a 30 year old uh, white male and I'm wearing a kind of orange mustardy t-shirt with a denim jacket and I've got brown hair and a big brown beard. Um, so today's seminar is on breaking bodily taboos and we'll be having three speakers and uh, we're very excited also to welcome Professor Siobhan McIlvany who will be our guest chair today. Um, first however I'll pass over to Becky who will introduce uh, this week's seminar topic and our guest chair. Thanks very much Becky. Um, just to reiterate, Ben, thanks everyone for coming and also for your abstract so far for the uh, conference in July. Um, so I'll start with my auto description. So I'm a 29 year old uh, white woman with gold rim glasses, long kind of blondish hair, and I'm wearing a beige fleece, <laughs> very excitingly. Um, all right, I'm going to introduce um, Siobhan, who's very kindly offered to um, moderate the session um, today. So um, Siobhan McIlvany is Professor in French and Francophone Women's Writing at King's College London, where she is currently Head of Department. Siobhan has recently published a monograph on the origins of the French women's press entitled Figurations of the Feminine in the Early French Women's Press, 1759 to 1850, with Liverpool University Press, and has co-edited a recent anthology on women's relationship to the urban environment entitled Women in the City in French Literature and Culture. Her research may, seem, may be seen to focus on two areas in contemporary French and Francophone women's writing. First, the importance of giving voice to those inhabiting the margins and who may find self-expression and a form of virtual community via non-conventional means, including the act of reading, second, the increasing predominance of narratives anchored in female bodily experiences or associated with different life stages and ages, whether narratives of anorexia, pubescence, or in particular of a desiring and desired senescence. Her most recent publications include a chapter entitled 
fictional transgressions in the matter of bodies in transgressions in 21st century women's writing in French published this year and the article entitled Living and Literary Bodies in Maïsebe's Isia and Esprit Créateur last year. So she's in a perfect position to bring our three wonderful papers together today. So I'll pass over to Siobhan now. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, I will auto-describe. I am blonde, uh, Scottish, um, shoulder length hair, and I'm wearing a white shirt with kind of horizontal stripes. First of all, thank you very much, Becky and Ben, for inviting me. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here, and I just really want to say thank you for kind of discovering such a productive seam of you know, research. I'm sure you were also kind of taken aback at just the, the kind of fantastic proliferation of, of papers that, that you have um, elicited. And also, I think these days more than ever, it's just been fantastic to have a kind of regular research forum where we all know, you know, fortnightly we can meet and see one another. And I think that's been a really important supportive environment. So thank you for that. What I, I want to do today, I mean, the format's just going to be the same as usual, which is 15 minutes, then questions and answers um, following all papers. So we'll listen to the papers first and then have a, a QA and a session afterwards. Um, this paper, the first paper that we're going to be listening to is by Freya, Freya Ferlander, who is at the University of Warwick, and her paper is entitled Ecologies of Skin, Gender and Landscape. So I will introduce each paper after you've heard the, the, the paper in order. But really, these papers are all grouped around the theme of breaking bodily taboos. So that's what unites them. So Freya's paper then. Freya, first of all, um, did her PhD on skin aesthetics, a study of skins in spectatorship. And the thesis combined conceptual modes in the analysis of skin in theatre and performance, from psychoanalytic theories to philosophical ideas to dermatological research and contemporary neuroscience. Wider research interests beyond this project include related inquiries in the field of medical humanities, specifically the intersections between the humanities and dermatology, the olfactory senses, including taste in relation to the skin and theater, as well as how science fiction depic depicts the skin and skin conditions. So Freya, over to you. Thank you. Just share my slides. Can you all see that? Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so good evening. I'm Freya. I'm an early career fellow with the Institute of Advanced Study at Warwick University. And today I'm going to be exploring the ecologies of skinscapes, to borrow David Howe's term, landscapes and genderscapes around Mary J. Marples's article, Life of the Human Skin. Uh, for the audio description, um, I'm a white woman, I'm 26, with brown hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a black and white jumper. So I want to start by taking you on a condensed skin safari, which is partly inspired by the dermatologist Monty Lyman's The Remarkable Life of the Skin. And the image you can see here is taken from the front cover of that book. I hope that the skin safari will function as an inroad for ways of thinking about the skin and its microbiome as well as by way of an introduction to microbiologist Mary J. Markles's articles Life of the hum on the Human Skin and the Normal Flora of the Human Skin. In this way, I suggest how Markles's works can be understood as inspiring medical humanities outputs, in particular W. H. Auden's poem A New Year's Greeting, as well as how her analogies between the skin and ecosystem or skinscapes and landscapes can be understood as being literally brought to life in contemporary artworks. And specifically, I'm gonna be looking at works by Joanna Raku and Melissa Fisher. So to begin, I want you to look closely at the skin on the back of your hand. Closer than that. What do you notice? A network of veins, very fine hairs, creases at the knuckles. Perhaps you see scars and are reminded of their stories. Perhaps you watch as the tendons jump under your skin as you wiggle your fingers. But what if we look closer still? As Lyman explains, quote, 
In the same way that the earth has radically varied ecosystems and habitats, including oceans and rainforests, deserts, human skin has a number of habitats that support radically different populations of flora and fauna. So the warm swampy areas between your toes, for example, are radically different to the dry desert-like surfaces of the forearms or the legs, or the oily habitat of your face. And while we're on the skin of your face, it's worth noting that so are these, the Demodex mites. Right now, they're clinging to your eyelashes and eyebrows. And at night, the male Demodex swims through the oil and sweat on your face in search of a mate. The females live in your sweat glands and hair follicles. They come out to mate and then they return under your skin to lay eggs. I hope you're still sitting comfortably, uh, although perhaps you're feeling more conscious of your skin as a lived in uh, and indeed lived on surface. So that short excursion across the skin is part of my wider research into skin bodied experiences um, and the way in which our skin acts as a site, sight and sight of embodied engagement. So the Demodex mites are acquired shortly after birth and are considered to be a normal part of our skin's uh, fauna. Uh, they're also unique to our family lines. And because of this, Lyman has described them as time capsules. So they might be of interest to historians and medical historians. Um, if you're interested in this, there's uh, some great research by uh, Elston, who looks at Demodex mites, facts and controversies. But Mary J. Marples also speaks about the Demodex mites. Um, and she explains, quote, that they live as Adam and Eve did in a paradise where all their needs are supplied and that the follicle mite Demodex inhabits the skin of most adult humans. So as we can see on the slide here, Marples included a series of these fantastic illustrations which uh, show whereabouts on the body that Demodex mites, uh, itch mites and various lice can be found. So what we've effectively just done is approach the skin in two different ways. Firstly, by looking at it as a surface, and secondly, by beginning to think about it as an ecosystem. Um, so Lyman explains there are more than a thousand different uh, species of bacteria, fungi, viruses and mites that might make up the skin's microbiome. Uh, different places and family units have their own microbial signatures. Um, so if we think about the handrails on trains, for example, and how many people use those, uh, this is a good way to start thinking about how we might come to share a similar, a similar microbial signature with those around us. Um, so in other words, how our skinscapes or our specific microbiomes are informed by the landscapes around us as part of a wider ecology. Which brings me to the focal point of this presentation. Uh, so I argue that microbiologist Mary J. Marples's Life on the Human Skin, which was published in Scientific American in 1969, makes the skin's ecosystem accessible to a general readership and opens up the skin's surface for imaginative engagement. Uh, she's also the author of The Ecology of the Human Skin in 1965, where she looks at ecological principles in relation to the ecosystem of the human skin. But Marples's Life on Human Skin opens with the reflection, quote, when someone is told that his skin supports a large population of microorganisms, he may look a bit uneasy and respond that he takes a shower every morning. His unease will scarcely be lessened by the information that showering or bathing which washes away some of the skin, exposes other microorganisms hidden in its crevices and therefore increases the total population on the skin surface, end quote. She goes on to say that the mere thought may well induce involuntary scratching, a reaction that you might well have felt just now when I spoke about the mites living on your face. Or if you start to think in more detail about the mites or the itch mites or the possibility of lice living on your skin. To mitigate this feeling of heightened skin body awareness, Marples' reflection opens out onto questions of perspective taking. She goes on to say, if on the other hand, 
one considers the skin from the standpoint of its natural inhabitants rather than its human host in terms of the appearance, comfort or defence mechanisms of the human host, a fascinating world comes into view. Marples effectively and imaginatively worlds the skin, our skins, as host to an ecosystem of flora and fauna. So Marples presents this idea of the skin as an ecosystem in relation to the definition of an ecosystem given by ecologist Eugene Odom, whereby the ecosystem is divided into three groups, the producers, plants, the consumers, animals, um, and the decomposers, which are mainly fungi and bacteria that break down dead plants and animals and thus return the essential elements to the soil substrate. Marples explains how it is the skin, or specifically the host skin, which acts in the role of the great producer. The Demodex mites fulfill the role of animals and consumers. Remember Marples' description of them living as Adam and Eve did in a paradise where all their needs are supplied. And then there are the yeasts, bacteria and viruses, which may fulfill the role of the decomposers. Drawing parallels between the skin and the natural world, she writes that the best terrestrial ecosystem for purposes of comparison with the skin is probably an ordinary soil. Both the soil and the skin obtain their organic material from without, the soil from above in the form of dead plant material and the skin from below. In both soil and skin, there is an extensive non-living matrix that is permeated by solutions and the living organisms in both are grouped around structures that penetrate the surface to deeper layers, end quote. So things like hair follicles or sebaceous glands, for example. So much of this talk so far has been looking at the ecologies of the skin in relation to the analogies that might be drawn with the natural world. I began by imagining how Lyman's skin safari and his description of the desert-like surfaces of legs or forearms, the swampy areas between toes, might work in practice as a skin-based tour. But from a short synopsis of the life on the human skin, we can see how Markles introduces these analogies. Um, yeah, we can see how Marple has introduced these analogies of skin in relation to the different uh, climates and eco or, uh, landscapes back in 1969. So her article opens with the following epigraph, and I quote, The skin is an ecosystem with a microscopic flora and fauna and diverse ecological niches. The desert of the forearm, the cool woods of the scalp, and the tropical forest of the armpit. End quote. Marples includes the photographs that you can see here, so an extreme close-up of the skin on the palm of the hand uh, alongside the terrain of an arid grassland which has similar kind of cracks in the surface as a visual comparison between skinscapes and landscapes. So the analogies between natural landscapes and the skinscapes is an idea that has captured the imagination and indeed opened up productive veins uh, between microbiology, dermatology and the arts and humanities. We can see this provocation to imagine the skin as a world in Marples' article when she asks, what is this world, the cutaneous world, like? What lives there and what happens when a newcomer arrives? So W.H. Auden's poem, A New Year's Greeting, you can see an extract of that on screen alongside an extreme close up on the, of the skin on the bottom of your feet, uh, was inspired by Marcus's work. The poem is written as a New Year's address to the yeasts, bacteria and viruses living on the narrator's ectoderm. We can see how Mark was inspired Auden through the imaginative analogies she draws between skin and the natural world and the description of the skin, human skin as a host world for its microbial inhabitants. Auden's poem imaginatively addresses the flora, fauna and microclimates of his ectoderm. It construes the skin as a microscopic world with imagery of natural landscapes, including the tropical forests of armpit and the deserts of forearm and the cool woods of my scalp, which are borrowed directly from Marples' article. Indeed, Marples concludes her article with the quote, 
when one feels about to be overwhelmed by the acts of God and man-made, man-inspired catastrophes that threaten and afflict us, one might take comfort in the thought that some action of which one is scarcely aware is a cataclysm in the cutaneous world, end quote. And we can see how Auden really runs with this idea, adapting it slightly to figure the host in a godlike role but also to imagine how the micro microbial communities would respond, quote, if they were religious folk. The narrative voice asks, how would your dramas justify unmerited suffering, which imagines acts of God as the acts of the host? We can see that Auden takes up Marples' provocation to imagine the skin from the standpoint of the microbial inhabitants when the narrative voice wonders how those microbial communities would be affected by and interpret the everyday acts of dressing, undressing or showering, akin to natural disasters such as hurricanes or floods. He also borrows Marples' description of skin rafts. Um, when he imagines microbial communities clinging to keratin rafts. And Marples describes how these rafts are host to uh, a whole range of microbial communities. And that's how they kind of move to a different host when they fall. So this imagining of the skin in relation to the natural world provides an inroad for the ways in which skin, landscape and climate, as well as gender, have been conflated in symbiotic imaginings of the female skin. In Howes's Skinscape's Embodiment, Culture and Environment, 2005, he describes how skins mirror landscapes and how landscapes can be gendered. Howes writes, writes, and I quote, the skinscape might also be a genderscape. He explains that while, for example, the Kwama men of Papua New Guinea identify themselves with the mountain ridges, they associate women with the swamps. Men's bodies are conceived of as hot and hard like the mountains, whilst women's bodies are conceived of as cold and permeable like the swamps. Just as men avoid contact with the debilitating engulfing swamps, so also do they avoid contact with women who are believed to have similar debilitating effects on men, end quote. He also gives the example of peoples who seek to cultivate the opposite skinscape from the landscape. So for example, the Azawa of the Sahara Desert uh, traditionally, and I'm quoting, traditionally force feed their daughter, daughters to achieve a feminine body that is so overflowing with fat that the skin becomes a dress of stretch marks, which provides an alternative landscape one that does not slip through a man's fingers, end quote. These are, of course, not unproblematic um, understandings of the female skin. And I can speak some more about some of the historical uh, understanding of uh, female skin, as well as notions of skinlessness a little bit later. Uh, but they are illustrative of the imagined intersections between skinscapes, landscapes, and genderscapes. So I want to conclude. Um, with some medical projects, medical humanities projects, by artists which enable us to see the skin, specifically its microbiome, in creative new ways. So Marples asked readers to imagine what the skin might look like from its microbial inhabitants' perspectives. But the following artists make those microbial communities visible. So as you can see on the screen here, this is Rebecca D. Harris's artwork uh, for the Welcome Trust's Invisible You exhibit. So the microbial communities are represented here in the shape of a human body by the embroidered fabric and beads which show uh, the skinscape akin to the contour lines on a map so that the skinscape and its microbial communities literally become landscape in the shape of a human body. Uh, other artists have made the microbial uh, communities visible more literally um, by taking them off of the skin via microbial swabs and uh, giving them a platform on agar. So here um, we can see Joanna Riku's uh, navel gazing project, uh, which is a beautiful set of alternative uh, self-portraits. So they're brightly coloured petri dishes which have brightly coloured microbial patterns that have been drawn on with those microbial swabs which have been taken from participants' navels. And finally, we have Melissa Fisher's Microbial Me, uh, which uses a mould of the artist's face 
um, to shape the agar sculptures that you can see here. Uh, so it's a face shaped agar sculpture, uh, which then becomes a living artwork because the microbial communities which have been taken from the skin are growing as part of this sculpture. So while Marple's invited readers to imagine the skin from the perspective of its microbial inhabitants, this live sculpture makes them visible. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And I'll welcome any questions at the end. Thank you. That was that was really, really interesting, Freya. And I think um, it was a kind of exciting tour around um, a variety of different body parts. Um, but also making us feel good that we've got our own ecosystem that's supporting various other um, microorganisms and mites. So um, thank you very much for that. I've thank you. Lots of questions that I want to, to ask already, but we will first of all move on to Catherine's paper. So Catherine Bryan is at the University of Cambridge and the title of her paper is Invisible Chain, the female experience of abortion across a century from Jean Couchet's L'Ensemencé, published in 1904, to Annie Ernaud's L'Evénement, published in 2000. Catherine is in the third year of her PhD, a part-time PhD in French at Lucy Cavendish College in Cambridge, and her thesis examines literary depictions of abortion from Belle Epoque, uh, from Belle Epoque, France, providing feminist close literary readings of largely forgotten texts. These texts include Jeanne Carouche's L'Ensemencé, Maurice Landé's La Grappe, uh, Jean Daricarère's Le Droit à l'Avortement, and Camille Perse's L'Hôtel. Catherine, over to you. Just unmute myself there. Thank you. Um, before I share my screen, I just wanted to double check. Um, could you make some kind of raise hand thing or do something if you cannot follow French quotations? Because I do have English translations I can use. OK, I'll be using English translations. Cool. OK, good. Just wanted to check. I'll just start sharing my screen now. Um, OK, uh, somebody make a noise if that's no good. Are we all good? OK, brilliant. Um, yes, yeah, so I just want to say um, before I start, um, firstly, a bit of a trigger warning that this um, does include um, discussion of abortion, which is a very sensitive topic. So um, if at any point you feel uncomfortable, um, absolutely fine to just sort of mute me or come away and come back for the third paper. Absolutely understand. Um, and also uh, just to say that I am, um, as Siobhan mentioned in my introduction, I'm not really, don't really look at contemporary stuff all that often. So be kind to me when you're thinking of your questions. I'm more of a better pot gal, um, but there we go. Okay, so um, um, just to say, uh, also describe myself, um, I am a, a white woman, uh, late twenties uh, with glasses, blonde hair, sort of shoulder length, wearing a turquoise top and a maroon cardigan. Um, and my uh, slides all have the same background image, um, which is by Louise Bourgeois. It's number one of 14 from the installation set uh, L'Infini from 2008. Uh, and it shows um, uh, sort of two figures, sort of human figures in pink uh, circles that are sort of like organs, um, potentially a sort of uterus kind of shape. Um, held uh, in a sort of chain of, again, an image of sort of bodily materials, um, hence my invisible chain of female experience uh, of abortion. Um, right. Published in the year 2000, 36 years after the titular event, Annie Ernaud's L'Evénement, provides a frank first person account of the illicit abortion that she underwent as a young woman. Although she had touched on the topic of abortion in her previous work, it is the first time she writes openly and in detail about her experiences and the procedure she underwent before the legalization of abortion in 1979. Jean Carouchet's L'Ensemencé, published in 1904, almost a century before Arnold's text, tells the story of Armand and her attempts to terminate three pregnancies. Unlike Annie, Armand is married and has the support of her husband in procuring and administering the abortifacients that is the um, cocktails of supposedly abortion inducing drugs. Multiple abortive attempts are all unsuccessful and by the end of the novel they have two children and a third on the way. 
If Arnaud's novel is about the abortion event of January 1964, Carouchet's is striking for the absence of such an event. Instead, it outlines the societal stigma experienced by a non-maternal woman and the mark left even by failed abortions on her sense of self. I will argue that in spite of these differences, Jean Carouchet's fictional Armand can be linked to the autobiographical figure of Annie through Arnaud's uh, and I've got the French quotation on the uh, slide, but I'll read the English quotation, uh, which comes from Tanya Leslie's translation of the text. Invisible chain of artists, female writers, literary heroines. So from so they're linked through this in, invisible chain and the female experience of abortion. Arnaud's work is often referred to by critics as autofiction, much to her consternation. Uh, she says, I have nothing to do with autofiction. In autofiction, there is a lot of fiction as it happens. In the end, I prefer the term autobiography, even though it is difficult for me to use it. So that's my translation of um, a quote from an interview with the L'Express from uh, February 2008. Yet Arnaud's term autobiography, autobiography is one that questions the very possibility of retelling one's life experiences. François Emmanuel Boucher addresses this question of genre, and again, French on, this, on the uh, slide. Uh, it's no longer autobiography in the traditional meaning of the term, as the text prevents the belief in the possibility of a coherent reconstruction of the subject. The story thus loses its regularity. The female narrator intervenes at any moment. The meta discourse acquires such an importance that it disrupts the story itself. The novel presents two women. The young woman coming to terms with an unwanted pregnancy in the 1960s, henceforth referred to as Annie, and the writer looking back at this time and attempting to find the words to convey her experience, I'll refer to this figure as Arnaud. The novel opens in a doctor's surgery as the present day Arnaud awaits the results of an HIV test. After the relief of the negative result, she is taken back to the same way I had awaited Dr. N's verdict in 1963 swept by the same feelings of horror and disbelief in anticipation of the pregnancy test. This shared sensation between past and present experiences, so she talks of la même horreur, la même incrédulité, the same horror, the same incredulity, suggests a unified sense of health, self, one which the novel soon begins to unravel, however. As Boucher notes from the quotation I gave earlier, the 1963 to four plot is interrupted continually by la narratrice, the narrator. Arnaud, who jumps between moments in what Boucher terms meanders of memory, and sections in which she reflects on the writing process itself. The text of the novel is broken into fragments, jumping between then and now, in what Pascal Sardin ascribes to a desire to attain a degree of extreme objectivity, Arnaud provides references to her source material for the novel, with quotations taken directly from her diaries of the time. In one of the many paragraphs given in parentheses, Arnaud directly addresses uh, the issue of proof. Apart from my diary and my journal, I have no sure indication of what thought, of what I thought and felt back then because of the abstract, evanescent nature of what goes through our minds. Arnaud's need for la preuve, proof, suggests there is an intended audience whom she is attempting to convince. The following paragraph further elucidates Arnaud's fragmentation of self uh, on the matter. She says, the only concrete evidence I have stems from the lingering sensations associated with people and things outside of me. The sparkling snow at Le Mont d'Or, Jean T's bulging eyes, the ballade of Sœur Sourire, which brings me proof of reality. So it's not the reader who needs this proof of reality, but Arnaud herself who cannot trust her own memories. How does Carrochet's novel from 1904 compare to Arnaud's metaliterary work? Initially, L'Ensemence presents a far more conventional narrator-protagonist relationship with its use of external third-person narrator. This is a work of fiction, and there is no sense of the author's personal entanglement, as with Arnaud. Carouché does play with narrative perspective, however. Armand considers her future happiness on the night before her wedding in the opening chapter. And these quotations are, uh, sorry, these translations are my own. Tomorrow, in this abode that she had just decorated, she would experience her first night as a lover satisfied at last. Tomorrow, we will give ourselves to each other for always. Tomorrow I, will, tomorrow, I will at last close the door on my happiness. Not only is the direct quotation integrated into the same paragraph as the uh, narrative, 
that two voices overlap in the use of the words demain, tomorrow, and enfin, at last, in such close proximity. As Armand faces the struggles of, an, of unwanted motherhood, it takes a toll on her sense of self and her inner voice reflects this. In the following passage after the birth of her second child, so much later in the novel, she attempts to understand her lack of maternal sentiment and her thoughts are given in quotation marks, but there is a distinct fracturing of her internal monologue. So um, this next passage shows that um, uh, we've got sort of three paragraphs of, of given in direct, um, direct speech. Again, I'll give the English, the French on the slide. And however, it is in me like an illness, like a disability. Oh, to admit it to a doctor, to a scientist who would understand me, who would know him. He would not treat me, but he, he would not treat me, but he would absolve me maybe. He would say, you are a very strange case, an anomaly, a monster, but it's not your fault. No, it's not my fault. I am the victim of something I do not know, of a hidden law that will probably never explain to me and which causes my life's misfortune. And despite it all, I'm ashamed. Oh, what misfortune. As with Arnaud's need to prove the reality of her narrative to herself, Carochet's protagonist is racked by self-doubt and the passage is littered with language giving way to ellipses. What is striking here, and a reflection of the contemporaneous attitudes towards Catholicism in the build-up to the 1905 law on the separation of church and state, is that Armand's quest for absolution through confession is from un médecin, or un savant, or a doctor or a scientist, rather than from a priest. In l'événement, Annie turns to both figures, but her treatment from doctors does not provide solace when the first doctor whom she asks for something to um, make the bleeding come back, instead providing her with a drug used to prevent women from miscarrying. Her regular doctor, Dr. N, is of no use either as he refuses to engage with her euphemistic request, simply instructing her on before and after care. Don't tell me where you're going, I don't want to know. Just make sure you take penicillin eight days before and after the operation. I'll write you out a prescription. When she calls him for help after the procedure, he recommends a painkiller that makes it clear he will have no further involvement. She describes her experience with the doctor on night duty, called in for the serious post-abortion bleeding, as exposure and judgment. Furthermore, the surgeon who dismisses her anxious questions with a sarcastic, uh, I'm no plumber, only expresses remorse when he realizes her social standing as a university student and not an ordinary sales girl or a factory worker. Her encounter with the priest is no better, and her only revelation from this is that I was through with religion. For Armand, however, the introduction of this second imagined voice of the doctor scientist, combining the dis disinterested medical language of Anka, une anomalie, a, a case, an anomaly, with the more loaded and judgmental, judgmental label of monstre, monster, gives Armand more confidence in her own defence. The uncertainty of peut-être, of maybe, from the first paragraph, is replaced by a stronger declaration of innocence in the return to her narrative voice after the doctor's voice. Non, ce n'est pas ma faute. No, it's not my fault. Shortly before the conception of a third pregnancy, however, Armand's inner monologue again starts to splinter into a dialogue, but this time the narrative form mirrors her mental decline. How do those who still have it, those who, having loved, still believe in the possibility of free love? Perhaps they only believe in it in appearance. They pretend to believe in it. You yourself, have you admitted your secret anguish to anyone? No, but I clearly carry the weight of it. You also commit the fault, the very big fault of making passion your aim in life. What madness. In this passion, uh, sorry, in this passage, Carochet combines the use of second person address with the hyphen punctuation to indicate a new speaker. But where the imagined voice of the doctor scientist was given a new line in the text, here we see signs of the fracturing of Armand's sense of self, and the voices are therefore held together in one paragraph, with no clear delineation to indicate which, if any, is Armand's true voice. The fleeting moment of clarity and absolution from earlier is gone, and she returns to a spiral of self-denigration and shame. Fundamentally, both novels tackle the question of how to talk about abortion, and in particular, how to deal with the associated shame felt by both women. Lorraine Day has written convincingly on Arnaud's depiction of shame in Le Vénement. 
while acknowledging that the process of organizing and enduring a backstreet abortion was a profoundly humiliating experience, Day argues that the keynote affect produced by her own ordeal is identified as pride. Indeed, towards the end of the novel, after she has recovered, she, uh, Annie uh, describes the sensation of walking around Paris as an erotic, uh, a woman who's had an abortion. I walked along the city streets, my body harboring the secret of that night of the 20th to 21st of January as something sacred. I felt proud, a feeling not unlike that experienced by lone sailors, drug addicts or thieves who have ventured where others feared to tread, a feeling that may partly have contributed to my writing of this book. Arnaud associates secrecy with sanctity. She compares her experience not only with the illegal acts of les drogués et les voleurs, the um, drug addicts and thieves, but the heroic navigateurs solitaires, um, lone sailors. For Armand, however, in L'Ensemencé, the forced secrecy of the abortive attempts brings out a different emotion. In the confusion into which the sudden burst of these new things had thrown her, it was shame which dominated, a shame of which she did not speak, but which choked her constantly. Shame of this information requested in euphemism, of these clandestine purchases, shame of these remedies, of all these vile concerns which dethroned her thoughts of love. Shame dominates Armand's thoughts and the syntax itself through its four appearances. Here the text imitates Armand's state of mind, with Carcher choosing semicolons over full stops, allowing the ideas to run into each other in one long sentence, building momentum with the addition of multiple subclauses and refusing the resolution of a final full stop with the sentence dissipating into ellipsis. As with Arnaud, there is reference to the criminality of the act as she goes on to describe uh, the suspicious vials and banned drugs, transforming the apartment into one of these sleazy back rooms where criminal abortions take place. For Armand, clandestine equals criminal. There are no pioneering examples with which to compare herself. Indeed, Armand's counterpart in the novel is her friend from childhood, Marie-Louise, who finds purpose in a passionless marriage through motherhood. Um, the novel tracks not only the collapse of Armand's sense of self, but of her only homosocial relationship. In a final confrontation between the two women in the penultimate chapter, Marie-Louise makes a surprise visit to her friend's apartment, where she spots the vials of abortifacients Armand has been using on her third pregnancy. After years of silence, Armand finally exposes her secret. The result of this admission is an explosion of words, and she challenges Marie-Louise directly. What? You are outraged? Oh yes, you are. Don't say that you aren't. Come on, I know. Abortion. You don't accept it, isn't that right? It's a disgrace for you, an infamy. You consider those who turn to it as criminals? Well, you can think the same of me, because I have tried, I don't know how many times, to self-abort. This comparison to the other criminel, criminals has none of the self-denigration of the earlier passage. She is no longer riddled with honte, shame, but she is able to see it as external to herself, imposed on her by the conventional maternal woman in society, represented by Marie-Louise. Once she's begun to speak, the consequences of such utterances no longer matter. At last she broke the silence kept, until then, about the misery of her life, unloaded her heart, let herself be seen with her powerless and desperate anger. Ah, to scream what had suffocated her for so long, to scream her thoughts and her acts, scream her pain of not being like others, her sincere efforts in vain, the torture of her amorous being that nature had forced into maternity. To admit all, to be pitied or blamed, what did it matter? But to speak, speak, say at last the words she had never dared utter. The very act of speaking is an act of defiance, not only against her friend's conservative ideals, but against nature, nature itself, and the maternity is forced upon her. Unlike before, when the desire to confess to a doctor scientist came from the need for absolution, here there is no such yearning. She simply speaks for the sake of speaking, and hence the lexus of speech, crier, avouer, parler, dire, parole, prononcer, dominates this passage. And finally, speaking aloud the words which have tormented her in a monologue, Armand is able to defend her actions. In outbursts of direct speech which run across several pages, she explains her motives to her friend. And the result is not the judgment that she has dreaded, um, but such is the power of her words that Marie-Louise has a revelation of her own as she leaves the apartment. Uh, she replayed Armand's last words and said to herself that she did not, in fact, know what love was. 
The chapter ends, therefore, not with a judgment on Armand's actions and lack of maternal feeling, but with the possibility that Marie-Louise's chosen path is not the only legitimate one. If Arnaud does not experience the same difficulties in finding interlocutors in the months surrounding her abortion, the sharing of this secret even brings her closer to O, a female acquaintance, where she has struggled to come to terms with her abortion is in her creative output as a writer. In an interview promoting the publication of the novel, she explains why she has waited 35 years to write about it. And this translation is my own. It's true, even if it features in several of my books, but it wasn't the theme of the book. It was only about 10 years ago that I started to see everything that this abortion involved, but I didn't dare say it. A kind of interior silence had set in. She elucidates on this concept of silence, silence, explaining that even in a French society where abortion has been legalized, there are still limitations on how to discuss it. It is couched within ideological debates, but we keep silent on the real experience of abortion. There is, for example, one thing that I had never said before writing it. It was that I was proud to have endured this ordeal. The process of writing her experience thus empowers Arnaud to vocalize a feeling hitherto unuttered. This process is not straightforward for her either. An introduction from writer narrator Arnaud towards the beginning of the novel explains, I began writing this story one week ago, not knowing whether I would go through with it. I just wanted to make sure that the urge to write was still there. The same urge that would seize me as soon as I sat down to write, sat down to the book that I embarked upon two years ago. Obeying the impulse seemed a terrifying prospect. On the other hand, I could die tomorrow without having done anything about it. If I were guilty of anything, it would be that. Just as the pregnancy was an interruption to her studies and plans as a young woman, the désir d'écrire, desire to write this novel, disrupts her writing schedule for her other book. She is haunted by it in her dreams, with the finished abortion novel absent from bookshops and catalogues and with the word épuisé, exhausted, uh, appearing on the cover. Young Annie does not see the pregnancy through to completion, but writer Ernaud completes the novel. Indeed, Day argues that it is deeply ironic that the narrator protagonist in L'Evénement fears the illegitimate pregnancy marks the end of her literary ambitions, when in fact the abortion, or rather its textual inscription, is subsequently perceived as the key which opened the door to her writing career. And so dealing with themes of silence, shame, and the disintegration of self, both of these novels demonstrate the power of the female voice when she gives herself permission to articulate her own lived experience. They challenge the taboo of the act of abortion, bringing the figure of the avorté, both attempted and successful, out from the shadows of infamy, infamy and reintegrate her within the spectrum of female identity. And I've just got my references there um, on the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was that was really rich, Catherine, and kind of fascinating. The echoes, despite the the decades separating these texts, the kind of formal similarities, the ellipses, the kind of drive for different voices, but also that kind of combination of shame and pride as well. So I thought, and the courage required to write that type of narrative. So it's it's kind of um, remarkable, and I suppose quite depressing that. You know, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. That, that so much time later, there's still many of the same themes recurring. But that was that was really fascinating. Thank you. So now we will move on to our third and final paper, um, and the paper is by Roxana Doncu, and the title is "From Babe to Baba: Aging Women in Dubravka Ugrezish's Baba Yaga Laid an Egg." So Roxana graduated from the University of Bucharest with a degree in English and Russian studies. She completed her PhD in cultural and literary studies at the same university. She's currently a lecturer in the modern languages department at the Carol de Villa University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Bucharest. Her research interests cover areas such as post-colonial and post-communist studies, world literature, translation and medical humanities. She's a member of the International Research Group on Literary Modelling at the University of Münster, where she's been invited to teach at the Graduate School on British, American and Postcolonial Studies. She has translated over 15 books from Russian, English and German. Roxana. <clears throat> okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, just to begin by, I will begin by describing myself. I am white, a woman. Um, longish hair, reddish, uh, and I think I'm wearing a gray top with some 
decorations on it. Okay. And now I will start by sharing my screen. Is it okay? Is it visible? Yeah, okay, <laughs> good, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, just to introduce the topic, uh, this is a picture of the author of Dubravka Ugresic uh, and the cover of the English translation of the book. Uh, it was published in the Canongate Myth series and uh, loosely, it's a reworking of the Baba Yaga figure and myth from Slavic folklore uh, as a reflection on the modern age aging culture. So uh, the novel is structured like a symphony uh, in four movements um, which have recurring motives. The first one is entitled, At First You Don't See Them. The second one is Go There, I Know Not Where, and Bring Me Back, A Thing I Lack. The third one is ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. And the fourth one is if you know too much, you grow old too soon. And I will talk briefly about each of them. Uh, the first one, at first you don't see, th see them, introduces the main theme, which is the invisibility of the third age, of the old age. And also the motives of women uh, or woman as an angel, demon and the bird. Um, and these motives, of course, they all um, refer to the uh, figure of Baba Yaga, who is both, both an angel, a demon, a bird, a woman, an old woman. You don't see them at first. They move past you, shadow-like. They peck at the air in front of them. Sweet little old ladies. At first, you don't see them. And then there they are on the tram, at a post office, in the shop, at the doctor's surgery, in the street. There is one, there is another. They move in a small formation, three little hands. At first, they're invisible. And then all at once, you begin to spot them. They shuffle around the world like armies of elderly angels. So the theme is that of invisibility, which refers, of course, to the social identity of the old woman. Um, as she is no longer in her childbearing phase and the object of the male gaze, she becomes dispensable. So basically, invisibility means non-existence. Uh, paradoxically, the invisible old woman is present everywhere. Her ubiquitous presence, a measure of today's culture of lies. Ugresic um, uses this term culture of lies actually to refer to the culture of communism but it can well be applied to this uh, modern culture of uh, beautifying artifacts and uh, prolongation of life. Uh, at the same time, this ubiquity of old women may be, regarding, uh, may be regarded as a sign of their liberation from the constraints of caring for their husbands and family. The second movement, which is go there, I know not where, and bring me back a thing I lack, um, is actually an echo of a Russian folk tale uh, called Go There, I Know Not Where, <clears throat> and Bring Me Back, I Know Not What. Uh, the fact that I Know Not What is replaced with <clears throat> a thing I lack uh, refers generally to the theory of the well known theory of woman as a lack, and also um, to the uh, story, uh, which, is, which is the story of. Uh, the narrator facing the illness and the aging of her own mother. Uh, and as the narrator says, uh, every, in a, for every woman, uh, her mother's aging is the image of her own future. Uh, this um, experience of having to care for her mother triggers very uh, deep down buried fears. So um, the story, of the uh, experience of the, of the narrator's experience um, with her mother's aging and illness begins with the invasion of the starlings. Uh, her mother had developed a brain tumor, metastasis to the brain, after seven years after having su successfully fought off a bout of breast cancer. The birds symbolize freedom, transcendence, and eternal life, but at the same time, uh, they bring back, they bring uh, to life this buried fears of the narrator, uh, 
and these fears actually have to do with her mother's aphasia, uh, of which anomia is a symptom, that is the lack of speech. And I have an, I have an example here, when her mother says, bring me the, what? The stuff you spread on bread, which was supposed to be margarine. And then, bring me the biscuits, the congested ones. And then the narrator explains, digestive biscuits. Her brain was still functioning. She was replacing the less familiar phrase digestive with the more familiar congested. The connection between language and the brain followed some different route. Um, this um, lack of speech in her mother um, being a kind of a mirror of the narrator's future and the narrator being a writer, uh, one can understand why it, it, it provoked or it, it, it made her fear so much her own or face her own mortality. <clears throat> And maybe, or perhaps her, her future illness. Uh, another symptom of old age seems to be shrinking. Uh, she began coming up with ways to help herself. She started adding diminutive words like little, cute little, nice little, sweet little, which the narrator herself uses in the introduction with sweet little ladies, which she had never used before. Perhaps that way she felt less alone. She cooed, another uh, reference to the birds, to the world that surrounded her, and the cooing made the world seem less threatening and a little smaller. She had shrunk, that is what it was, and the world was looming. Uh, the third movement is ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. Uh, the transition to this third movement is done by introducing the character of Abba Bagay. If you look at the, um, at the name, it's actually um, the mirror reflection of Baba Yaga. Uh, Abba Bage is a young Bulgarian woman who acts as a guide for the narrator on her trip to Varna on the occasion of her participation in a contest called the Golden Pan of the Balkans. Uh, Abba Bage, the student in Slavic languages, is also the author of the last section of the novel, The Fourth Movement, which is a theoretical commentary on the mythology of Baba Yaga. So we have these trios, the old mother, the mature daughter, and the young woman uh, who reappear in the third section as a trio of old women going to a wellness center or to a spa in Czechoslovakia, actually the former Czechoslovakia in the Czech Republic. Uh, and these three women are called Pupa, Kukla, and Beba. Uh, all the names uh, refer to doll or babe in different languages. Uh, the aphasia that affects her mother's speech is also reflected into the next se uh, section by some formulaic endings which separates the stories. Uh, because in, in aphasia, what is, um, what is retained is this ability to use formulaic language. For example, what about us? We carry on while life like a seal wallows in the glee, the tail sails off to the open sea. Or another one, as for us, we carry on. While life's road may twist and bend, the tail hurries on to reach its end. And there are, of course, uh, a lot of them. The three old ladies, um, Upa, Kukla, and Beba. In a wheelchair sat an old lady with both feet tucked into a large fur boat. It would have been hard to describe the old lady as a human being. She was the remains of a human being, a piece of humanoid crackling. The old lady had a tiny face that consisted of a skull and aged skin stretched over it like an island stocking. The other one, the one pushing the wheelchair, was exceptionally tall, slender, and of astonishingly erect bearing for her advanced years. The third was a short, breathless blonde, her hair ruined by excessive use of peroxide, with big gold rings in her ear and large breasts whose weight dragged her forward. The first one is Pupa. A former gynecologist, she is the oldest, 88 years old, and she wants to die. Pupa often dreamed about how nice it would be if someone were to take her to Greenland and forget about her, lose her the way one loses an umbrella or a glove. She had reached a stage where she was unable to do anything anymore. A typical Pupa pronouncement is, money is shit, people are like flies, and where do flies land if not on shit? With a training in science, she is a no-nonsense woman who believes 
that we exist in order to procreate. As a hard-boiled utilitarian, she thinks that is, death is the natural solution. Uh, her desire for death uh, is also an indirect criticism at the culture of life prolongation and life extending strategies, uh, which is uh, part of this section and which is represented by Dr. Topolanek. I will talk about him later. Uh, Kukla, the second one, or the woman footnote. Um, uh, Ugresic has a whole theory on the woman footnote. Uh, in the novel, she is described as the perfect wife, a wife cover, a wife prosthesis, or a wife mask. She is well fitted for the role of wife. She accepted her role. She made no demands. She did not attract attention in any way. She was feminine, but not provocative, open to a certain point, pleasant, but not overly so. Uh, she acts as a shield for her three husbands, who perceive her as a protector, nurse, mother, surrogate wife, all in one package. However, despite being married three times, she is still a virgin. And after the death of her third husband, an invalid writer, she, publishing her own, she publishes her own writing, Desert Rose, as her husband's posthumous novel, earning instant success. Uh, and now a few words about the women footnote. Um, uh, Ugresic has a theory about uh, this historical women footnote, who are actually creative women, women endowed with uh, talent, but who chose to live in their husband's shadow uh, and to facilitate the husband's success. And she gave, uh, as an example, uh, Isaac Babel's wife. Okay, and now to go to the third one is Beba. She is born into a working class family. She is an anatomical illustrator at the Faculty of Medicine in Zagreb. Uh, she's the only one who has actually a great zest for life and who fights actively against the sign of aging. Uh, and I uh, underlined here in the quotation, it's a long quotation about how her, her body is uh, disintegrating. Uh, Beba and her body lived in a state of mutual intolerance. And uh, in order to uh, hide um, the disintegration of the body, uh, she began to wear a minimizer corset, which reduced the size of her bust, large earrings, strikingly long scarves, big brooches, big rings, all with the intention of deflecting the critical observer's gaze. Um, as I said, she, she really likes and enjoys her life. Uh, so in the spa, she goes to massage sections. Uh, she takes a massage, which is called... Um, uh, let me check again. Uh, the massage of Suleiman the Great. Um, and she, he, she falls in love with the Bosnian, uh, who is exoticized into a Muslim by the spa manager suffering from priapism. And now to Dr. Topolane. Um, he's a child of the revolution in Central Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, he basically makes a lot of money out of um, uh, putting into practice the old communist theories of. Um, uh, life uh, extension and uh, life longevity is. Uh, and there are uh, all these theories are discussed in the book. Um, most of all, uh, Bagamoles, Alexander Bagamoles' theory, he is an Ukrainian, and also the Romanian, Anna Aslan, uh, who was famous for, for inventing the Gerovital. Uh, so he is the Central European version of the sign of patriarchal order, lumping together aging men and women and lecturing them on ideas of longevity, also ignoring their differences. Uh, and in the folklore uh, story, he is the modern day equivalent of Kashi Bismertli, uh, is in Russian Kashi the Immortal, the archetypal male antagonist. And now I have, uh, I'm not sure if I have to describe this. Uh, pictures. Anyway, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the right side, it's a picture by Munch of three old women. And then I, I tried to find a, a picture of Dr. Topolanek or, you know, a, a doctor just to, anyway, to um, put them together. So basically, Dr. Topolanek is, represents capitalism, consumerism, the totalizing gaze, essentialism. And then you have the three women, Pupa, Kukla, and Beba. Uh, for Pupla, her body is the other. She is totally dysfunctional. So uh, th this is why she wants to die. She is no longer connected to her body. The body doesn't listen to her any longer, so she wants to die. 
Uh, gender socialization is irrelevant for Pupa. As she was born in communism in the equality between men and women. This is why uh, her character is like this. For Kukla, who is still a virgin, the body, her body is still a mystery. The gender socialization of success, as my quotation proved, so she was perfectly fitted for the role of wife. Uh, for Beba, um, her body is the object, uh, you know, this uh, concept of Kristeva, the object being something between the self and the other, something that you have to, you don't recognize and you have to set borders between you and that thing. Uh, she doesn't want to come to terms with the fact that her body is disintegrating. And her gender socialization is actually still going on. She's basically living her life. She was very poor and uh, couldn't live a normal life. So she is living her life now as she's getting older. Uh, in the fourth movement, we have Baba Yaga, who is this mythical figure chosen to mediate among the variants of female aging. Uh, and I have a quotation uh, from the book. Um, myths are means, units of cultural transmission or units of imitation as defined by evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Myths take themselves to pieces, add bits on, mutate, get transformed, adapt and readapt. They travel. In traveling, they retell and translate themselves. They never reach their destination. They are locked forever in a transitional, translational, translational state. There is usually no single clear-cut mythic story. There are only numerous variants. Uh, and the egg from the title is a symbol of the renewal of life and resurrection. And as such, the title points to aging as a transitional state whose natural end death is part of the endless cycle of life and death. Uh, Baba Yaga uh, acts as a symbol of polyphony, polyphony in the sense of Bakhtin, uh, many voices or multi-voicedness, multiplicity, metamorphosis, and transformation. A baba in Russian is a kind of a floating signifier. It means old woman, grandmother, lady, woman, wife, and is also a colloquial term for a cowardly man. Uh, in noun phrases, it's used to designate female demons or witches and also popular names for illnesses. And uh, the text lists a lot of variants of Baba Yaga. I only gave a few uh, just for the sake of examples. Uh, also, uh, the roles of Baba Yaga are different. She sometimes appears as a helper, a donor, as an avenger, a villain, as a sentry between the two worlds, as an intermediary between worlds, but also as a mediator between the heroes and, uh, in the story. She is part of the mythological family of old and ugly women with specific kinds of power. Uh, the recurrence of number three associated with women, the trio, old mother, middle-aged daughter, young woman, and also the three old women, uh, points to the triangle of female power and authority, and also to the fact that a complete woman is young, it should be taken whole, young, middle-aged, and old at the same time, like Abba Bage, who is uh, described as an aging child. It is also a reference maybe to the third age, which in connection with the archetype of the groom, points to liberation and empowerment. Liberated from the objectifying male gaze, women can turn into the subject of their own lives or their own writing. And the final question is, how do women cope with their post-hormonal, post-sexual self? Well, the answer that the novel provides is also a lack. So there is no single answer to this question. Actually, what the novel does is to decenter the notion of aging women because it shows that there are as many variants of old women and as many ways of aging as there are many faces and interpretations of Baba Yaga. And with this, I conclude. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Roxana, for that really interesting mixture of different types of aging and in some ways the kind of palimpsestic notion that that you know we have lots of others within us as we age that that we are kind of 20 30 40 50 concurrently so i thought that, that was really really interesting what what we will do now is move to the the q a so please if you want to uh, put any questions in the chat uh, please go ahead if you want to raise your hand uh, please do so um Perhaps I could just, as chair, um, get the ball rolling because um, 
I'm, I'm, I've got quite a few questions I'd like to ask everybody, but I will try and limit it. Um, so maybe uh, Freya, if I could ask you first, um, I just I thought that was really, really kind of rich and thought provoking. And, and the couple of questions that sprang to mind were, I wondered if you could enlarge a little on the significance of the term skin safari, and if perhaps you see it as also having kind of potentially problematic connotations in the sense that in some ways it, it, the, the, the term safari perhaps has a kind of notion of potential voyeurism that you are you are viewing something that is not yours, that you are kind of going on an expedition to a, a place that is not necessarily your natural habitat that's unknown to you. So I just wonder if you say a little bit about that. And the other thing I just wondered about, I was thinking when you were talking about um, analogies between skinscapes and the natural landscape and genderscape and really interesting use yeah. of kind of showers and rain. And it also made me think that particularly the female skinscape is constantly saturated with artificial products. Mm -hmm. that, that there is, you know, in, in some ways, and perhaps the aging skinscape, the aging female skinscape even more so. So I just wondered how that would also relate to, to this notion of kind of that, that analogy between the natural world and the, 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 the skinscape. Yeah, there's, there's lots, lots in that question. Super, super interesting question. Um, it's interesting you should ask about the skin safaris. First of all, um, that's borrowed, it's, I think it's chapter two in Monty Lyman's book, The Remarkable Life of the Skin. So it is called uh, Skin Safari. Um, so the way that that kind of came about is kind of thinking, he uses very similar descriptions to um, Marples. I'm not sure whether he had read Marples before, or whether there's just a natural inclination to kind of compare our skinscapes to various landscapes. Um, but I thought about, he, he kind of has that section where he's like, let's look at our hands. And I thought about how we could turn this into um, kind of a mode of engagement via the screen um, in a way that you're not you're not able to do like touch based activities anymore so I thought how can we you know provoke this skin bodied engagement via um, a screen based medium so that's kind of looking to bring to life what he's talking about in this populist dermatology text uh, but in many ways it is something that Mary J Marbles had already covered in 1969 um, that's I mean, your question about whether safari is problematic is um, really interesting in terms of it is voyeuristic. You know, there are these, I, I hadn't thought of that um, previously, but it, there are all of these communities that live on our skin that although we are the hosts are you know, living by, you know, by themselves and in a constant state of flux with everything else. And it's not just, uh, there's a part in Marples' article where she looks at how this kind of idea of an ecosystem uh, breaks down because it's not self-contained. It's in um, kind of flux with other people as well, with the natural environment, all of these processes of exchange, uh, skin rafts which fall off, and that's how you pick up uh, via another host. Um, yes, yeah, so that is a really kind of thought-provoking uh, way of thinking about it. Uh, I think you know, in, in Auden's poem as well, there's certainly that voyeuristic kind of, or the, the, the kind of sense that you want to play God in this relationship with the communities on the ecto, ectoderm. Um, the second part of your question, which looked at uh, the, the ways that we look to kind of cosmetis, cosmeticize, or the cosmetics that are available for our skin, particularly with aging skin as well. Um, I've been speaking to some students studying dermatology at King's College recently um, and the skin's microbiome is hugely under-researched in comparison for example with the gut's microbiome um, and we know from various commercial health products that the gut's microbiome we've got uh, I don't know Activia all of these other health products that are designed to keep that in balance but we haven't quite tapped into that in the same way with skin products yet. So I, I think you're going to see as research into the skin's microbiome increases and develops, I think you're going to see a huge expansion of that market. But in terms of the market that we already have, um, I think as far as I understand, lots of products 
uh, particularly things with collagen, the idea that you can fit molecules of collagen for them to be absorbed through the skin, that can't, that can't happen. It, you know, it essentially plays into anxieties, I think particularly female anxieties surrounding um, you know, the aging process. You're being sold. It's kind of interesting because uh, how you, you feel does affect the appearance of your skin. Uh, so actually if you're feeling positive about a product you're using, it is possible that that will affect your skin, but the actual ingredients, so for example, collagen particles aren't gonna sort of go through the skin and you know reactivate uh, the collagen production, which I think declines at a rate of, don't quote me on this because I think it's wrong, but I think it's about a percent each year from the age of 25. Um, okay. But, That's yeah. yeah, no, it did. And Shirley's just uh, put something in the chat as well, um, saying, yes, I was wondering about the ageing skinscape too. And in association with that, I was wondering whether there was a meeting place between the kinds of socially recognised constructed taboos around the skin that we all recognise very readily and your dermatological micro focus. Yes, yeah, so I think wondering about the ageing skinscape too and association, it's wondering whether there is a meeting place. So if I understand that correctly and correct me if I haven't, um, historically, I think um, the taboos surrounding female skin was to do or were to do with where femaleness was located. And that was a very superficial surface um, based uh, reading of what it means to be female, I think you kind of have similar uh, phenomenons which happen now where you are sort of made to feel very conscious of the skin as a surface that you need to alter in whatever, uh, you know, either cosmetic ways. Um, I'm not sure whether that answered your question. I've unmuted, that... I've unmuted Frey, I'm sorry. Maybe the question really wasn't very clearly articulated there. And I mean, it does answer the question. It's just that, I'm, listening to your material and, and looking at and learning all that fascinating stuff that I hadn't really known before about my own skin. Um, I, I really enjoyed, I was thinking where, where, where are the taboos actually here that are being broken? So I just began to think more generally about skin and taboo and the more commonly recognizable things such as aging skin or skin diseases, or, you know, that, that if you like, you don't need a microscope to see. Um, so I was just wondering where, in terms of, of breaking bodily taboos, whether there was a kind of meeting place between your sort of scientific and art-based focus and the kinds of constructions that, I, that I'm talking about there. Yeah. Um, it's still a rubbish question, Freya, and if it is, no, no. that's fine. <laughs> um, I'll mute again. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. Um, I think just the idea of taboo, um, I think, certainly when I've looked at historical conceptions, again, um, much, much earlier, but there's also the idea of kind of the female skin as a container as well. And that if you take to, that there's a figure, the Akosh figure, and often, or for a long, long time, that the only figure that was depicted um, with the flayed skin, which is the Akosh figure, was the male Akosh. Um, and then you just didn't really see the female Akosh for a while. And I think, that sort of ties into the fact that historically the skin had been conceived of as kind of a container of essentially filth, um, which is you know rooted in kind of misogynistic and sexist thinking about uh, the female skin. I think I, I don't know if what I sort of presented on today fits so well with the idea of taboo but when you speak about um things like skin conditions for example things that are noticeable just without having to look uh via like a microscope or something um one of the things that sort of came to my mind was the work by ariana page russell who has a skin condition called dermatographia um and she essentially raises awareness of that skin condition uh, rather than sort of you know you know, feeling self-conscious about it, she integrates that as part of her artwork to kind of raise awareness of the condition, but it essentially means writing on the skin. Um, so she creates all of these really bright and, and colourful works with actual writing on her skin where she draws the patterns. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there's, 
probably a lot more that I could say on that, but going off on kind of tangents, did that, did that answer? Thank you. Yes. The, the other thing just briefly I was thinking of was the hymen, which is also skin, but internal skin. And that made me think of that as well about the container. I don't know if you know um, Nina Borawi's Le Voise Interdite, but she has a kind of, you know, fantasy passage where the hymen is broken and the kind of inside comes out that there's a kind of inevitable merging of inside and outside with the breaking of the hymen. So I thought that that was another type of skin that's internal um, as well. So that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. That's that's great. I, I just wanted to let me just see. Um, OK, so. This is from Anne, this is not a question, barely a comment. Interesting, it's all about the perception. Very interesting to see the relationship between the mental perception and the physical reaction. The interaction between the two tends to be, I think, quite separated in the sciences. Maybe less and less with gut microbiome research, as you mentioned. I think that relationship body-mind was articulated in some ways in all three presentations. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right, Anne. Thank you for that. Maybe then if I could just um, move on to ask Catherine a, a quick question about um, her uh, text. So, uh, first of all, I was really interested in um, uh, the fact that you, and you didn't talk about them in today's paper, Catherine, in, in too much detail, but I just wondered about two things really, about the reception, if you have any knowledge of the reception of these early text and it seems to be toured by men and toured by women maybe that's not right but that you know how they were received because I was also thinking from Erno's perspective as you know she first dealt with abortion via fictional means in Les Armoires Vides and then moved on to Livinement so even you know she too kind of moved from you know different forms in the over the duration of her career and I just wondered if you could say anything about the reception of the early texts that you work on and perhaps the kind of creative impetus behind them because I think one thing that that comes through in Levinmal is that kind of desire to to relate to other women so um so by for example I, I remember the kind of scene where the abortion takes place and the, the, the lose, I think, at university, where she says, despite the kind of very isolating spatial surroundings, she's kind of locked away, I felt a sense of kind of almost intergenerational pride and in linking with other mm -hmm. women who'd also gone through this, this experience. So I suppose, you know, it, do you think that some of the earlier texts were also, um, there was a drive for kind of, some form of relational community building there as well? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I can certainly talk about, in, it's limited how much I can talk about the reception of these texts, um, but I do actually, um, I've been able to track down reviews of Um And I was really struck because I was expecting it to be this kind of like, earth-shattering idea that there were women who didn't want to be mothers because the whole something I didn't really talk about too much is is Armand's feeling of alienation from not only her friend Marie-Louise but from you know there are moments where she's sitting in the park and she sees all of these women who are mothers and playing with their children and she kind of like looks at her own kids and just feels nothing and it's like you know she is this sense that she is completely separate you know she is this freak who does not fit in with other women at all and yet the two reviews that I've been able to find so far um the one that goes into detail um and I, I can't actually it's a real thing that they didn't tend to really say who was writing the pieces in the newspapers at that time so I don't know if this review was from a man or a woman um I don't know why but my gut instinct is a man but he's saying that the the reviewer is saying that there are going to be so many women out there that read this novel and and can actually relate to this feeling, which I was not expecting at all. Because when you talk about sort of, so you asked about you know what's the aim of these novels, um, and actually the my my thesis is looking at um, romances, so thesis novels, broadly speaking, and I'd say this this one is sort of is the least 
a thesis novel. Um, so it's talking about the other novels that I look at. So, for example, Le Doua à l'avortement, the right to abortion. It's very much this is why you should stop being a hypocrite and, you know, you should actually look at this person who, through the course of the novel, he learns that even though he thought this, when he experiences this in his personal life, he realises that women should have the right to abortion. Um, and actually, it's so the, it tends to be, so far that I found, the male authored texts are much more sort of like rigidly, this is why you should believe this. And my sort of, my thesis is that the belly pork, which I've just seen hilariously, I read the comment that, that was belly pork. Oh, I love that. Um, <laughs> uh, the um, that it was sort of in the wake of the depopulation crisis that they were having in France after the Franco-Prussian War um, at the end of the nineteenth century, and so and sort of unbeknownst to them, leading up to the First World War, there was this real crisis about um, you know how are we going to rebuild France's population in order to be a viable force within Europe to try and compete with, you know, reunified Germany and all of this. Um, and so abortion kind of comes to the fore as this, it's, it's more seems to be a topic about, it's not how Arnaud sees it and I think how it comes across in Arsenal C. It's not really a woman's issue, actually. It's more depicted as this is why it's really important that, you know, we should be having, we should be encouraging people to have children to rebuild the population. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of this one novel kind of comes out from our... Um, from the rest of my thesis but I think it does really speak to Arnaud's novel which yeah it like you said it's kind of a sad way that I and I, I still think you know I, I read this novel and it 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 feels so relevant even to this day of women's experience of can they talk about you know whether it's feeling a lack of maternity which today I mean it's still seen as a radical choice um or any other things about whether you can actually voice these things. Um, sorry, I've gone off for a long time there, but um, I hope I answered. No, uh, that's um, that. I, I completely, I completely agree with that. Um, and and I think actually I was reading Chanson Douce for other reasons again today, and that struck me as well. That you know, Slimani has said repeatedly there's no such thing as maternal instinct, and it's still mm. both are said it in forty nine. And uh, you know, enfanter c'est prendre un engagement, and it still creates such a flurry of shock. Mm -hmm. Any, you know, uh, I've seen her give various kind of presentations, and when she says it, the, the the room there's ripples of disquiet in the room whenever she mentions it. So there is that sense that that, that there are certain issues that still cause um, consternation. Um, Becky, Becky has got a question for Roxana, so sorry, I'll be quiet. Becky. Um, yeah, thanks, Roxana, for introducing that um, book. Well, to me, to us, uh, I hadn't heard of it before, but you kept on coming all these slides of like more and more layers of like potential medical humanities kind of intersections and topics, just like the representation of like the wellness clinic and then the doctor and you know the four older women, and it just seemed to be incredibly like layered with all of these different and then the aphasia as well with the older aging woman, uh, mother. It was just very very rich like there must be so much to say about it um there was one particular quotation from the slide which i wrote down which is kind of gross but i just really loved it she, she, i think it was in one of the middle sections where um an older woman is described as a piece of humanoid crackling <laughs> i just sort of yeah. saw it on the screen and i thought yeah. that is so harsh oh my gosh <laughs> and the novel is actually hilarious i mean if you read it uh, and it, indeed, as you say, it's it's multi-layered. I mean, it begins with this uh, introduction into the um, narrator's problem with her mother's aging. Then it's the uh, story about the three women, all of them different, all of them having different life stories, and they converge at the wellness spa with Dr. Topolanek, who is trying to, uh, who is lecturing them on longevity. Although you know, Pupa wants to die, another one wants to have sex, and the third one just finished the novel, so she doesn't care about anything else. And then you have this theoretical digression, which is actually like um, um, 
the, the third part is actually like a, a paper given at a conference on, on uh, Baba Yaga. And then, of course, there are all these... She, she's a great admirer of Nabokov, so I think this is why you have all these, you know, language games and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, um, she's, one, she's one of the greatest um, writers from the uh, Central and East European space. Yeah, because that, that quotation, the piece of humanoid crackling, if I just come back to that, because I, when you put it on the screen, I thought, okay, this is either like um, just being, you know, deliberately harsh, or I thought it's actually quite funny. Like, it's very, like, visceral and has a nice crossover she, skin with yes, yeah, no, no, paper. No, no, no. So some yeah. people were shocked. Not only people in, in the West, also people in her native country who call her a witch. She's, uh, she's, she has very strong language, but she's yeah. also very funny. I find her very funny. Yeah, because I was wondering, is that kind of dark humor? Is that part of like how she's kind of breaking all of these taboos? So you yeah. have the silenced old woman, yeah. and then she kind of gives this really like viscerally yes. kind of hilarious <laughs> description, kind of owning it in yeah. a way, owning the aging. Yeah. yeah. And actually, the description of the body, the disintegrating body, how she develops the fat behind. Actually, it's her own body because she she put on a lot of weight and she's describing herself and how she's not coping with the fact that she grew fat. But yeah, that's why. Okay. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, the, also the, the humanoid crackling, it ties in with the belly pork and the yeah. belly pork, all these. <laughs> you've got all these echoes too. But, um, yeah, thank you. That was that was great. I suppose I just could ask one tiny last question to Roxana as well, which was, are there positive representations of aging in the sense, is it always depicted as some form of loss, Roxana? Um, in the novel, no, hmm. no, not really. But it's 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 actually born. It's a, it's a novel that is born out of fear, and this fear is actually like you know in in the old novel is is brushed off with laughter. So she makes up all these comic portraits as a way of laughing and you know dismissing or discarding the problem. Well, that's old age. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just Thank had. You. Thank Sorry. you for your question. Um, Roxana, are you familiar with um, Tatiana Tostaya? Uh, uh, with Tatiana Tostaya? Tatiana Tostaya. Tatiana Tostaya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And her story, Mila Shura? Because I just thought there are some really interesting comparisons. So it's it's the story of this old woman. And when yes. you're talking about the diminutives and all of that, and I was thinking about the fact that it's shorter it's when she's Russian. This is the Russian. This is the Russian tradition. Yeah. Yeah, um, but it's Alexandra when she's the young woman. Uh, the Grace has translated a lot of uh, Russian literature. She's a fan of Russian literature, and actually this whole story is inspired by Russian literature. There is a discussion of Ruslan and Ludmila. A lot of Russian quotations. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't mention it because not many people are familiar with <laughs> Russian literature. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to read. Freya has, has double-checked her statistic. So we lose roughly 1% of our collagen every year from our early 20s, and this accelerates after the age of 40. But fortunately, the percentage was not given, so that's fine. So it accelerates <laughs> to 1.1. So that's good. So, uh, well, I just want to say thank you to all three speakers. It was really, really so fantastic. And um, it's just given me, which is great, you just want to go and read and write. And it, it was a really, really stimulating trio of text. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Perhaps before if I hand back to Ben, if I could just give a little shout out to a little bit of uh, publicity for Women in French who are hosting a conference, a remote conference, which is organised, uh, I think Polly is here, Polly Galis um, and Julie Rogers, based in Maynooth University in Ireland, from the 7th to the 9th of May this year. There's fantastic papers you know, three days, I think, of wonderful papers. And the, the title of the conference is Femme Dérangée, Femme Dérangeante. So Disturbed and Disruptive Women. So that's 7th to the 9th of May. So a little bit of uh, publicity there for that. But OK, I'll be quiet. Thank you. Over Thank to you. Thanks so much, Siobhan, uh, for that. And thanks so much for guest chairing today. Um, and thanks to all of those, uh, the speakers, th those papers, I absolutely love them all. I thought that was fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, I'll just very quickly, before we all go and have our dinner, uh, introduce Seminar 12, which will be on the 9th of March. 
Um, and that will be on women, mental health and identity. And we'll have uh, three speakers in as well. Uh, we'll have Anne Mutijo, who will be talking about madness and identity in two novels from Martinetian women writers, Fabienne Canor and Nicole Cage Ferentini. Um, and we'll also be having uh, Beradai Wejadan, who will be talking about Between Patriarchy and Madness, Forging Female Identity in Maxine Hong Kingston's The Woman Warrior. And we'll be having Alicia uh, Tinari, uh, who will be talking about Alda Marini's Memories of the Asylum, Institutional Violence and the Politicization of Illness in 20th Century Italy. Um, so, yeah, hope to see you all there. And please do sign up via the link, which I think Becky's just put in the chat. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, again. Really uh, love that and see you all next time. Thanks very much.